A very pious friend of mine, having heard that I had said the world was full of imperfections, asked me if the report was true. Upon being informed that it was, he expressed great surprise that any one could be guilty of such presumption. He said that in his judgment it was impossible to point out an imperfection. Be kind enough, said he, to name even one improvement that you could make if you had the power. Well, said I, I would make good health catching instead of disease. The truth is, it is impossible to harmonize all the ills and pains and agonies of this world with the idea that we were created by and are watched over and protected by an infinitely wise, powerful, and beneficent God who is superior to and independent of nature. The clergy, however, balance all the real ills of this life with the expected joys of the next. We are assured that all is perfection in heaven. There the skies are cloudless. There all is serenity and peace. Here empires may be overthrown. Dynasties may be extinguished in blood. Millions of slaves may toil neath the fierce rays of the sun and the cruel strokes of the lash. Yet all is happiness in heaven. Pestilence may strew the earth with corpses of the loved. The survivors may bend above them in agony. Yet the placid bosom of heaven is unruffled. Children may expire vainly asking for bread. Babies may be devoured by serpents while the gods sit smiling in the clouds. The innocent may languish unto death in the obscurity of dungeons. Brave men and heroic women may be changed to ashes at the bigot's stake while heaven is filled with song and joy. Out on the wide sea, in darkness and in storm, the shipwrecked struggle with the cruel waves, while the angels play upon their golden harps. The streets of the world are filled with the diseased, the deformed, and the helpless. The chambers of pain are crowded with the pale forms of the suffering, while the angels float and fly in the happy realms of day. In heaven... They are too happy to have sympathy, too busy singing to aid the imploring and distressed. Their eyes are blinded, their ears are stopped, and their hearts are turned to stone by the infinite selfishness of joy. The saved mariner is too happy when he touches the shore to give a moment's thought to his drowning brothers. With the indifference of happiness, with the contempt of bliss, Heaven barely glances at the miseries of earth. Cities are devoured by the rushing lava. The earth opens and thousands perish. Women raise their clasped hands towards heaven, but the gods are too happy to aid their children. The smiles of the deities are unacquainted with the tears of men. The shouts of heaven drown the sobs of earth. Having shown how man created gods, and how he became the trembling slave of his own creation, the questions naturally arise, how did he free himself even a little from these monarchs of the sky, from these despots of the clouds, from this aristocracy of the air? How did he even, to the extent that he has, outgrow his ignorant, abject terror, and throw off the yoke of superstition? Probably the first thing that tended to disabuse his mind was the discovery of order, of regularity, of periodicity in the universe. From this he began to suspect that everything did not happen purely with reference to him. He noticed that whatever he might do, the motions of the planets were always the same, that eclipses were periodical, and that even comets came at certain intervals. This convinced him that eclipses and comets had nothing to do with him, and that his conduct had nothing to do with them. He perceived that they were not caused for his benefit or injury. He thus learned to regard them with admiration instead of fear. 
he began to suspect that famine was not sent by some enraged and revengeful deity, but resulted often from the neglect and ignorance of man. He learned that diseases were not produced by evil spirits. He found that sickness was occasioned by natural causes, and would be cured by natural means. He demonstrated to his own satisfaction, at least, that prayer is not a medicine. He found, by sad experience, that his gods were of no practical use, as they never assisted him, except when he was perfectly able to help himself. At last he began to discover that his individual action had nothing whatever to do with strange appearances in the heavens, that it was impossible for him to be bad enough to cause a whirlwind, or good enough to stop one. After many centuries of thought, he about half concluded that making mouths at a priest would not necessarily cause an earthquake. He noticed, and no doubt with considerable astonishment, that very good men were occasionally struck by lightning, while very bad ones escaped. He was frequently forced to the painful conclusion, and it is the most painful to which any human being ever was forced, that the right did not always prevail. He noticed that the gods did not interfere in behalf of the weak and innocent, he was now and then astonished by seeing an unbeliever in the enjoyment of most excellent health. He finally ascertained that there could be no possible connection between an unusually severe winter and his failure to give sheep to a priest. He began to suspect that the order of the universe was not constantly being changed to assist him because he repeated a creed. He observed that some children would steal after having been regularly baptized. He noticed a vast difference between religions and justice, and that the worshippers of the same God took delight in cutting each other's throats. He saw that these religious disputes filled the world with hatred and slavery. At last he had the courage to suspect that no god at any time interferes with the order of events. He learned a few facts, and these facts positively refused to harmonize with the ignorant superstitions of his fathers. Finding his sacred books incorrect and false in some particulars, his faith in their authenticity began to be shaken. Finding his priests ignorant on some points, he began to lose respect for the cloth. This was the commencement of intellectual freedom. The civilization of man has increased just to the same extent that religious power has decreased. The intellectual advancement of man depends upon how often he can exchange an old superstition for a new truth. The church never enabled a human being to make even one of these exchanges. On the contrary, all her power has been used to prevent them. In spite, however, of the church, man found that some of his religious conceptions were wrong. By reading his Bible, he found that the ideas of his God were more cruel and brutal than those of the most depraved savage. He also discovered that this holy book was filled with ignorance, and that it must have been written by persons wholly unacquainted with the nature of the phenomena by which we are surrounded. And now and then some man had the goodness and courage to speak his honest thoughts. In every age some thinker, some doubter, some investigator, some hater of hypocrisy, some despiser of sham, some brave lover of the right, has gladly, proudly, and heroically braved the ignorant fury of superstition for the sake of man and truth. These divine men were generally torn to pieces by the worshippers of the gods. Socrates was poisoned because he lacked reverence for some of the deities. Christ was crucified by the religious rabble for the crime of blasphemy. Nothing is more gratifying to a religionist than to destroy his enemies at the command of God.
religious persecution springs from a due admixture of love towards God and hatred towards man. The terrible religious wars that inundated the world with blood tended at least to bring all religion into disgrace and hatred. Thoughtful people began to question the divine origin of a religion that made its believers hold the rights of others in absolute contempt. A few began to compare Christianity with the religions of heathen people, and were forced to admit that the difference was hardly worth dying for. They also found that other nations were even happier and more prosperous than their own. They began to suspect that their religion, after all, was not of much real value.